we have been led to believe that development is always a straight line, upwards and onwards. So it's not hard to understand why the notion of sustainable development quickly translated into a call for green growth. However, a sustainable economy needs to break with the workings of the linear economic model in which we take resources from nature and we use them to make products that are only used for a short period of time, perhaps just once, before we throw them away as waste. Take, make, waste. From where we are today, development needs to be a circular movement. The idea of a circular economy is to circulate resources so that they stay longer in the loop and so that we can get more from less. Today we know a lot about our planet, but there is still a lot of things that we do not understand. But what we do know is that we need to reduce the material throughput of the economy. Either we do so by choice or by necessity. The climate is changing and global average surface temperatures are already 1.1 degrees Celsius higher than the reference period around the Industrial Revolution. According to the International Panel on Climate Change, we might transgress two degrees of warming already in the 2030s. And as a result, 1.2 billion people could be displaced by the climate crisis. And these are conservative estimates. Like I said, there are a lot of things that we don't know. And there are things that we don't know about the changing climate because they have not yet occurred. But what we now know is that it is very unlikely that we will be positively surprised. And in that sense, the 21st century will present us with major challenges. And as economists, this is our greatest test yet. Now, sustainability means taking into account the well-being of future generations. That is, well-being not GDP or economic growth, but our ability to satisfy human needs and wants. In the past, increases in human well-being was greatly linked to a growing GDP. But nature was abundant in the past centuries. And so the availability of produced capital was the main determinant of economic output. However, today, produced capital has become the abundant factor and nature is becoming scarce. And that means that we can no longer increase economic output merely by investing in technology, infrastructure and machinery. We need to invest in nature. In today's world, we have an economic growth which means that the growth in goods and services no longer contributes net positively to human welfare. Because the gain from increased consumption does not outweigh the loss of welfare that follows from the depletion of ecological systems. That means that the development strategy of the past, which is growth, has become uneconomic. Now, Nature is the foundation of human existence, and hence, it lays the basis of all economic activity. Natural capital are the stocks of resources that form our natural wealth, and from this stock flow streams of amenities or services that make up our natural income. We depend on nature for basic life-sustaining services, such as cleaning the air we breathe and the water that we drink. And all economic activity is based on the use of nature in one way or the other. There is no sector in the economy that is independent of nature. And some might even say that dependent 
does not suffice to describe our relation to nature because we are nature. Or without nature, we are not. So then, sustainability means respecting the planetary boundaries. Still, economic activity is depleting natural systems at a global scale. And now, this is the planetary boundaries framework, which was published by a group of scientists affiliated to the Stockholm Resilience Center. And they have defined nine critical boundaries that we need to stay within. And that's the red circle that you see around the Earth there, beyond which we believe that there are, are important tipping points. So we need to stay in the green zone um, in order to ensure that the planet remains a stable system where humans can thrive in the decades and the centuries to come. Now, climate change, for example, has transgressed the safe area, that's the blue circle that you see a little bit further towards the middle, while loss of biodiversity is far beyond the red critical line. The biochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus are also in the critical area, threatening to destabilize entire ecosystems, which again will drive climate change. So the planetary boundaries framework tells us that it will not suffice to focus on climate change alone, and that we cannot solve anything by simply putting out some windmills and solar panels, because that will drive land system change, which is the field you see shooting out, the yellow field shooting out to the left. And that is a, an important driver of biodiversity loss, which again affects climate change. So in short, everything is connected. And if we are to reduce the stress on ecological systems fast enough, we need to think radically different about how we structure our economies. But sustainability is not about saving the planet. If you just wanted to save the Earth, then we might easily jump to the conclusion that the problem is there are too many people on this planet. But then, should climate refugees be left on the border to starve because we're already too many? No. Sustainability is about ensuring the economic possibilities of future generations. And we cannot do that by taking from the people that are already alive today. Neither can we let the green transition contribute to further marginalization of already vulnerable communities. The sustainable transition needs to be just. And this is where the donut enters the picture. The model was first published by Kate Rayworth in a book with the title Donut Economics, where she suggests a new paradigm for thinking about economic development. She builds on the planetary boundaries framework and combines it with the goals from the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And now the green donut shape circle in the middle um, marks the safe and just operating space for the economy in the 21st century. And on the inside of the green circle, you now see the things that we can all agree on are necessary for people to live good lives today, such as the access to food and water, housing, decent employment, safety, peace, and so on. The challenge for the 21st century economist is to make sure that we do not overshoot the planetary boundaries, while at the same time making sure that no one falls short of the social foundations. Now, how do we do that? In fact, no one has achieved this yet. There is no country that occupies the safe and just space. And in that sense, we're all developing countries now. But there are some key lessons in donut economics that we can learn from. First, we need to change the goal and target the things that really matter. For a long time, the target for economic policy has been a rising GDP, believing that this would enhance human well-being. But growth was never supposed to be an end in itself. Growth was always the means to an end. And then we need to see the full picture and realize that the economy is embedded in the natural world and that all economic activity affects natural systems 
and that this changes the quality and quantity of natural capital, which again determines the economic possibilities. What we can choose is the degree and the sign of this effect. We can choose to affect nature in a positive way and create positive cycles, or we can affect it um, for bad and fall into vicious ones. This is our choice. The future will present us with major challenges. Today we take nature for granted, and now we see where that has led us. But what if we place nature at the center of economic analysis and policy? Because if economics is a science studying the allocation of scarce resources, then sustainable management of natural systems should be at the center stage in the economic universe. And if we did that, we would quickly see that investing in natural capital will contribute positively to human well-being today and the economic possibilities of future generations. Now, this might sound a little bit hard and difficult, and some of you might want to search up that on the stock market exchange. How do I invest in nature? But listen, nature is qualitatively different from all other kinds of capital. Why? Because investments in physical capital, financial capital, human capital, always entails devoting time and resources that could otherwise have been consumed. But natural capital is qualitatively different. While other forms of capital depreciate over time, nature is resilient and it reproduces itself if we allow it. Hence, we need to work with nature. And we need to learn from nature to adapt to the new economic realities of the 21st century. And one thing that nature would never do is to waste resources. Circular economy is an umbrella term for a wide variety of different actions and strategies that aim at reducing our dependency on extracting new resources from nature, while at the same time reducing the waste and pollution that comes out on the other side. We must learn to see waste as a resource, to create products in a way that they can be repaired, um, and also make sure that the product can be deconstructed after we're done with it, so we can pick out the different materials and use it over again. And we must relearn not just taking from nature, but also to give something back. We must move from monoculture to permaculture and find ways to enrich natural systems in a way that they can still contribute to human well-being and to our production. Thank you, and good luck.